Hello, and welcome to episode 146 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. This is John Denning in Los Angeles. And this is Dave Kaloran in Napa Valley. My man, how goes it? It's going great. Yeah? That's good to no, hear. No, that's a lie. I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of us. I'm tired. I'm tired too. Four day LSAT, uh, then a whole bunch of collation and analysis, and now we're recording this on a holiday, much to my regret. Yeah. Um, MLK is not getting the justice from us that he deserves today because we're working through it. But sometimes you just have to power through. We don't really have a choice. We want to get this out. And unfortunately, this holiday is on a Monday. And although I would very much prefer not to have to do this on a holiday, unfortunately, this is the lot that we've been uh, cast here. Well, let's see if we can find a silver lining. Do you at least have something to drink? I do, John, as <laughs> always. In this case, a um, we know that there was a game that was in use uh, over this past LSAT that dealt with wine labels, which is obviously a personal interest of mine. And uh, the last time you were here, the first winery we went to was Larkmead. That's right. We did a tasting there. And so I have a bottle of uh, their Firebell, which is like a Cab Merlot uh, kind of mix that we tried when we were there. Yeah, I remember that well. Um it got fuzzier as the week went on, but I remember the first place we went pretty well. Uh, Lark Mead's great. I'm big into wine labels too. I don't know nearly as much about wine, but I do like just the the nature of the labels. And I picked uh, something kind of unconventional for me. I went like bottom shelf here. I think I've got a $13 bottle of wine, which is not typical, but it has a really cool label. And if anybody knows this brand, they might know some of the backstory of it. It's from a, a wine label called 19 Crimes which is in reference to the 19 different crimes you could commit uh, in Britain around the early 1800s that would get you sent off to a penal colony in Australia. Banishment. You could sent to Australia. Yes, that's right. I guess that is redundant, right? Um, so yeah, it was things like you know larceny or um, highway robbery, things like that, fraud. My favorite one is impersonating an Egyptian. Apparently that was a crime that would get you shipped off down under. Um, my guy is a guy named Michael Harrington on this label who apparently committed a mutiny and then planned some great prison escape from Australia, took a rowboat in a thunderstorm and hopped on an American vessel and made it to the States. Or so the story goes. Enterprising. There you go. He's an inspiration to us all. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem like much of a, uh, of a penalty in, in hindsight. Oh, you have to leave England and go to Australia? Seems maybe that was a long-term good deal for some of those people. Yeah, I get the feeling it was a little rougher around the edges 100, 200 I years think ago. so. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think the trip was pleasant either. You, for them, it was yeah. probably a, uh, a lengthy trip, which means it was very much a long and winding road. I knew you were going to do that. Well done. <laughs> if you hadn't, I would have. Well done. Uh, I had to make that play. Uh, one of the students I was corresponding with was like, hey, is there any chance you could choose that song by the Beatles? And uh, I was like, it's interesting. That is a song that we have kind of like carved out uh, for use at some point because we really feel like there's going to have to be a moment in, in LSAT history when the long and winding road is wholly applicable. And so uh, we've taken the easy way out this time. And that is the song choice. A great song. Uh, actually, one of my more favorite Beatles songs. And almost anything by the Beatles is great. So that's the song. That's the drinks. John, let's get to it. All right. The LSAT world. Here we go. Indeed. Well, we know that what we're dealing with right now is January. And we know that we'll see scores here at the end of the month. But if you are looking to take one of the upcoming LSATs, you have a few options. The first one would be February registration has closed, but that's the next test. Right now is slated as a two-day test, and I think it's going to stay that way on February 9th and 10th, and you get your scores at the end of February. If you are looking further and you still need to sign up for an LSAT, there is one in April of 2024. It is the Thursday, Friday, Saturday currently, the 11th, 12th, and 13th of April. You can register for that for almost another six weeks or so. The registration closes on the very last day of February, which this year is is the 29th of February. We've got an extra day. The scores come out in May. And then there's the June LSAT, which is going to be early in June, the 6th, 7th, and 8th. And then that registration uh, doesn't close for several more months. That's 
April 23rd, and then those scores come out right at the end of June. Typically, what you'd be thinking is if you took January or February, you're probably applying uh, in the current cycle. And if you're taking April or June, it could be one of two things. You might be preparing for the next cycle. Uh, There are still some schools in this cycle that will take either of those tests, amazingly enough. And some very top schools actually will take all the way through June. And then for a lot of people, they're using April or June to either increase their scores to uh, get a little bit better financial reconsideration or to use those tests to get off the wait list, uh, which is actually an intelligent strategy that I've seen a number of students in the past use go out, crush a test like April, and all of a sudden submit the test to the school that you were waitlisted at. And they're like, here you go. Here's the admit. So pretty cool. And if you're preparing for any of those, we've got a couple of webinars coming up. John, the next one here is on January 24th, which is probably, you know, we're getting short on time for Logic Games, but this is a Logic Games Uh, webinar on understanding templates, one of the most important concepts to understand in attacking logic games. Then there is one on February 6th that uh, we ran a few times in in, in private sessions for some uh, specific law schools. It's called Applying to Law School as a Non-Traditional Applicant. So we're actually bringing this out to the broader public. We did it for, I think, five or six schools, and it was really well received. And we're going to expand it a little bit and uh, probably open it up uh, to everybody. So if you're a non-traditional applicant, typically out of college, maybe been in the workforce for a few years, maybe a little bit older, that will actually appeal to you. Uh, You have some advantages in the process, and you have one or two disadvantages, usually family obligations, work obligations. Then we come back, that's on uh, February 6th, we come back on the 20th of February with another Logic Games. We're going to stuff those in right now while we still can. You can see the theme here that we're trying to really pack (laughs) the games in as much as we can before June. That's exactly right. That's a Logic Games circular games um, webinar. And then on the 28th of February, got a comparative passages uh, webinar in reading comprehension. And then John, you and I are back for sure doing another crystal ball on March 6th. And that is the April slash June LSATs that we're going to cover there. And um, that should be kind of interesting as well. So if you are taking February still, you can get our January slash February crystal ball that is available for free on our website. It's at forward slash LSAT, paraschool.com forward slash LSAT. And then you just fill out a form and they will send you access to that. And as we'll discover in a few minutes, John, we did all right again. Yeah. In terms of predictions. I appreciate that reminder about the March 6th crystal ball because I have got a trip to replan. I forgot all about it and I was going to go somewhere. Now I have some apologies to make and some things to reschedule. But I will be here on March 6th for the crystal ball, as will you. It takes priority. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate the reminder. Um, (laughs) I'd have found out about it on March 4th and been a real pickle. You probably would have. And that brings us to the January 2024 LSAT, which anybody listening to this probably has taken. Uh, If not, it means you're heading down the line to a retake. This does not cover content that will appear on the retake. We know there were some of the usual one-off problems that we have with proctors and connectivity and so forth. And then there was a little bit larger set of issues related to weather. Yeah. You're you're referring to the makeup test next week, Um, not just a general retake, just so people are clear. Yeah, it's a makeup. I think about it as a retake because a lot of people started and then couldn't get going, but it's retake slash makeup. You can go either way with that. So this conversation is not really pointed towards those tests. We're not going to cover anything that we expect you to see uh, on that makeup uh, test date. Uh, Let's take a real quick recap of what happened over this particular LSAT. So, John, this one started on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. What's your take on starting LSATs on Wednesday? Oh, I hate it more than... I was going to name some terrible thing. I hate it. <laughs> it's Would just, you rather have, it have to work on Wednesday week. covering this or Sunday, though? Well, the sad truth about this is I worked on Sunday all day anyway, putting this stuff together, still corresponding with people, answering questions, putting out fires. So, yeah, Wednesday was just an extra day. Sunday was a given. 
let me say that this test, which went Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I absolutely hate the fact that it's a four-day test, and I am going to officially request that LSAC no longer hold these over holiday weekends. Because my wife said to me, she's like, if it wasn't for this stupid LSAT, you, we could have gone someplace on the on the long weekend because our daughter had uh, off from school. Right. And she's a huge LSAT supporter. She knows what it is that that uh, I do. And I've never heard her talk like that. She was peeved. <laughs> and justifiably so. I'd have gone somewhere this weekend too, probably. But nope. Nope. Yeah. But, and I, you know. I hadn't thought about it. But once I did think about it, I was like, you're right. Sucks. Don't do this on a holiday weekend again where somebody's got Monday off because you've just destroyed all sorts of people's good times. Uh, so for that, it's it's a uh, thumbs down to LSAC on the scheduling. But Wednesday was the start. That was January 10th. There was about 4,750 people scheduled. And then Thursday was the same thing. Uh, all day, 4,750 scheduled. Those were the two smallest days. And then on Friday, it started to amp up, unsurprisingly, people getting closer to the weekend. That was 6,000 scheduled. And then Saturday, also unsurprisingly, was the biggest day with about 6,700 scheduled. Now, they never hit those numbers exactly. Uh, they're always a little bit less because of no shows, uh, you know, withdrawals, what have you. But you end up with around 22,000 people scheduled to take this test, which it had come down quite a bit. It was the original registration numbers were up over 30,000 or at least close to it. So it did drop, but that's normal. This is still a very big test for January. This is why you see it at four days. You can tell how much smaller February is going to be because right now it's just two days. It doesn't look like they're going to add any. They already could. But that was our essential setup in terms of like how they were spreading it out. And aside from the weather issues and the usual one-offs, overall, I thought this was fairly smooth in terms of how things progressed. There is always systemic, there's like a built-in structural set of failures with proctors and, and connections. So if that happened to you, we're sorry. Uh, but aside from the weather, the people who were able to get in seem to generally, and again, that's a really uh, loaded word, generally have a decent experience. Yeah, it's something I haven't had to be mindful of in quite a while because in-person testing has only been back for maybe five months or so. But for the longest time, people had to be really mindful, not just of when they wanted to take the test, but where because of test center closures, weather issues. And we saw some of that here with the in-person testing too. Um, first time we've seen it, but it definitely kind of plagued certain locations. Yeah. And speaking of that kind of like in-person you know, brick and mortar kind of experience versus the remote online experience. Overall, about 48% of all test takers were in person. Mm -hmm. So that number has crept up uh, from what it used to be. And I think that's because there were some online problems. We know how bad August was. And so people taking it online has gone down a little bit. But to me, the interesting fact of that is when you look inside that information, what you see is that on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, so the weekdays, the in-person testing percentage is only about 37.5% to 45%. On Saturday, when people had more free schedules, the in-person testing percentage was, about, was over 55%. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see that people do really want to take it in person, but scheduling is, you know, it's easier to take it at home if you flip around and go back to work or get back to school and not have to take a trip. So a little bit where you get the, oh, it looks like it's 50-50, but it's actually shifting considerably inside the days themselves. Another interesting consideration, because we know there have been times where seats are limited for the in-person testing. So if you know going forward, you want to test on a Saturday and you want to test in person, pay really close attention to when they open the scheduling up, because the sooner you can get in there and claim your spot, the better. These things can fill up. And Saturday appears to be the day when it would be most likely to. Exactly. And I think they make more spaces available on Saturday, but at the same time, the demand is clearly higher. Yeah. Now, if you were one of the unfortunate souls who had a problem, and we know that there were more than a few uh, for whatever reason, the makeup is scheduled for Tuesday, January 23rd. That means if you had a proctoring issue, and I heard more than one or two stories of people being ghosted by their proctors after the first two sections, which is literally the most frustrating thing that can happen when you're when you're taking it remotely and you feel like, all right, I'm doing all right. And then Proctor says, bye-bye. When you retake the test, when you make it up on the 23rd, 
Bad news is you'll start all over from scratch. It'll be a new test. You'll start on the first section. They don't pick up where you left off. Yep. Uh, and for those of you who had weather issues, again, same thing. You'll just start off with a whole new test because you never even saw anything right there. Yeah. And let me reiterate the fact that it will be a new test. Uh, it's not going to be any of the content that Dave and I discuss here today. It's part of the reason we're allowed to do this in the first place. But if you're listening to this, hoping to get some sort of makeup advantage, unfortunately, nah, it won't happen. The good news is, regardless of when you take the test, whether it was just this past couple of days or whether it is that retake day on the 23rd, the makeup day, everybody gets their scores on January 31st. That is a Wednesday, and scores come out around 9 a.m., sometimes just a few minutes beforehand, and that's Eastern time. So everyone, at least, even if you get delayed on the LSAT, your scores don't get delayed. That's at least a nice thing. All right. Let's move along, John. Let's do it. We've alluded to some issues. Did you see anything here that was truly systemic? Um, you, you mentioned August before where the whole thing kind of fell apart, but did you see anything like that this time? Other than weather systemic, no. Yeah, me neither. I didn't see any system-wide outages, really. So. No. Which is good. This is what you want. You, anytime you have a system issue, it means catastrophic failure for hundreds, if not thousands of people. We didn't see that. We just saw weather, which is uncontrollable. Uh, and I'm not going to blame anybody for bad weather. Well, may maybe our forebears for climate, you know, yeah, warming and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> as, as a generation, I could, you know, maybe point something out. But um, the proctor incompetence really seemed to be the biggest thing. And that, unfortunately, is really just hit or miss. It's luck of the draw as to who you get on the other end of the, the line, so to speak. Um, you mentioned proctors ghosting. Some creepy proctors out there, too, trying to flirt mm -hmm. and drop little, you know, hints of things. I don't gross. really, yeah, I mean, it's just gross. I, the only thing I could give is in terms of advice for that is just try your best to ignore it. Get in your own headspace, get in your zone and let the proctors just kind of exist outside of it. And then report it afterwards. And definitely report it. Um, the other biggest complaint that I saw was about this search function. For those who don't know, it used to be the case that you could use a keyboard control with control F and you could search the screen for certain words, text that you wanted. It's pretty useful for some people in reading comp, for instance. LSAC replaced that with a built-in, baked-in piece of their interface, which is now meant to be a search feature. Some people had no problems with it, but a lot of people did, to the point that people were actually asking me if it would qualify them for the makeup, just how bad and glitchy, buggy the search function was. Um, my answer to that, by the way, for anyone who's wondering is, it's not up to me and I don't know. That's not a clear cut case, unfortunately. I saw a report of one person who said they were granted a makeup because their search didn't work. Um, that to me is right on the fringes of uh, what LSAC would allow typically. Usually it's that you can't finish the test, not that just something went wrong during it. Yeah, my take on that is that is the unfortunately more rare case. Yeah. And that they largely don't consider search to be something essential. It's actually a new feature to the LSAT since it went online. And they don't feel like it's something that you absolutely should have. So I think more often than not, they'd be like, sorry, you had a search issue. Call it a day. Uh, and not really grant a retake. So I'm surprised that someone actually was able to get that. Yeah, me too. If it was really bad and you can document it, then I would say maybe give it a shot. But again, no guarantees there. Yeah. And it was glitchy in person and remote too. So if you're trying to find a way around that, unfortunately, I think you're, you're probably going to struggle with it either place. Although again, some people reported no issues. Strange. It is strange. Also, LSAC, get that worked out. This is 2024. There is no actual explanation or justification for having a failed or glitchy search process on your browser for real. That's yeah. all I have to say. I, that's enough of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, fair point. All right. You ready to get, let's to, the get content? to the test? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hopefully breeze through this. Of course, I say that every single time, then it takes, uh, you know, like two minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get into talking about the various tests, the international tests, some accommodated tests we saw, and then the primary test comment, uh, we're going to run through a few reminders and disclaimers about uh, things related to the discussion that we're about to have. So the very first one is, is we request quite politely and humbly that you do not summarize this online. Just send people to this podcast. It's really easy to miss nuance. 
if you're just trying to relate, you know, a couple sentences about what we said, whereas a lot of times we try to shade things one way or the other, and we really want people to hear what we said directly. Next thing I'll remind people of is that as you take the test, section order doesn't mean anything. You can have the same section order as someone with identical content. Someone else can have the same exact order and have completely different content. You can have someone else who has the same exact content, but in a different order. So sections, orders, and content change all day long, each day of the LSAT. So just don't think to yourself, oh, I had this RC first, means anything. It could have been that someone else had it fourth. When they talk about disclosure, uh, I think as most people are now aware, LSAC does not want people talking uh, online, uh, especially in public, about topics and question specifics during the test. That's because they don't want the experimental to be outed so people who take it later would have an advantage. So they ask that you not uh, post specific solutions, answers, things like that. They ask that you wait until the main test administration days are over, which for our purposes was really Saturday night. Um, so the thing I will say is, is we use a lot of public information in making these analyses. We use a lot of student reports and, and other pieces of, uh, kind of information as well as kind of like our massive database on past test usages and history. One thing I will remind people is, is if you have had an experience and you don't hear us talking about it, it's because we didn't hear from you. There's always some groups of test takers where they use content for a very low number of individuals, not thousands, maybe not even hundreds, maybe just dozens. And so if we haven't heard from one of those people, it's not going to be included here. We think we've gotten a pretty good overview of all the content, but we know how many different forms they use these days, and we're always concerned we might have missed one. So reach out, let us know how your test went, give us uh, some updates so that we can actually add that to the information that we have that helps not only current test takers, but future test takers as well. Another thing I'll say is that when you take the test, it always feels worse than taking a practice test. It's just not the same type of experience. There's a negativity bias that will creep into your recollections. So if you hear us say, hey, that wasn't the most difficult logic game section of all time, but it felt like it was to you, keep in mind that you're seeing it through the filter of pressure, of anxiety, and that that makes any experience a lot less enjoyable, fun, and relaxing. So that negativity bias sometimes makes people walk out saying, that's the worst LSAT I've ever seen. And to them, it did feel that way. And I understand that. And later on, they look at it and they say, okay, it wasn't the worst. It just felt like the worst. That's the difference between the real thing and a practice test or prep test that you take on your own where you know that it doesn't account. So keep in mind also that we think every every section on the LSAT is difficult. When we say something's medium or wasn't that hard, it means relative to high difficulty. There's some that are just super killer and there's some that are like, all right, it hurt, it wasn't fun, but it wasn't the worst ever. Keep in mind also that the test makers actively attempt to confuse you by putting similar question topics in multiple different sections. Uh, You might have a question about a country and then hear someone else talking about a question about a country. It doesn't mean you had the same section. You have to make sure that it's actually the same topic in the same direction. They do this so much, it's not even worth mentioning anymore. There's so many examples of it. Also, our estimations of what are real and experimental are based on certain assumptions about test reusage, namely that if they used a section previously as a scored section, when they reuse it, it will not be Uh, experimental. It'll be a scored section again. So far, we haven't been wrong on that, but we've seen them do some interesting things at times, so it's just something to be aware of. Uh, You may not hear that your section being discussed or one of the sections. It could be that you don't recall because things do get fuzzy under the pressure of the test. That happens more often than I think uh, you would even expect it to happen. Also, sometimes, as I said before, sections aren't used that frequently or only a small portion of test takers got them, we might not have heard about it. If that happens tonight, send us a message. Be like, hey, I had this section. I didn't hear you talk about it. I've had people send that to me, John, after the test. And then I'm like, no, no, go to minute 41. We're talking about it right there. And they're like, I don't know what happened. It happens, <laughs> you know, it happens to me now. every time too. Someone's like, I can't believe you didn't mention this question. And I'm like, yeah, actually that's minute 46. So yeah, listen closely. But if you missed something here, um, let us know. I won't try to clarify. Last thing, once again, same as the first thing, please do not summarize this online. Just send them to listen to the podcast. It's free after all. 
And I'm going to make one more comment, John, and this is for future test takers and people who are preparing right now or someone who knows they're going to retake this test. One of the things that we strongly recommend that you do is once your test is over, jot down some quick thoughts on each section, various topics that you might have seen in games, reading comp, logical reasoning, uh, especially when you have two sections of something. The reason is, is a lot of times by the time by the time you get to this podcast, maybe it's three, four, five days after your test, it gets so fuzzy, it's easy to forget. And a lot of times people will say, I, I recognize which section you were talking about, but I forgot which one it was of mine. And I don't know whether I thought that was the hard one or not. So to help you in the future, figure out what scale you had and to avoid confusion over figuring out which section was yours, make a few notes for yourself and actually get in the practice of doing that anytime you do a practice test. It will really help you going forward. And on that note, John, let's talk content. Let's do it. And let's start overseas, Dave. Let's begin as we typically do when there's an international test administered. Let's start with the international test. Um, do it. You, listener, are also going to hear Dave and I talk throughout this about the crystal ball that we did for the January and the February test and the accuracy and applicability of it, essentially giving ourselves a, a score, a rating. Um, and I can start right now with the international January test. Interestingly enough, this was a reuse of sections from the October 2022 LSAT, which themselves were reuses of a prior test back in July of 2019. I think that was the half digital, half paper test um, for those with a long memory here. October 22, and the podcast on it was one of the ones that we noted in our crystal ball, one of the, I think, eight tests that we listed out in terms of their likelihoods. So if you had a chance, and I heard from several people internationally who did, to listen to that podcast, some of this should have sounded familiar or been familiar when you went and sat down to take it. Let me run through it though. I only saw one test form in use overseas. To again, quote from Dave, if you don't hear your section mentioned internationally here, it's because we didn't hear from you. Um, but it's never too late to let us know. We'd love to hear now. Let's start with games. 23 questions. Again, uh, the most recent instance that I'm aware of here was October 22. Here were the four games. I believe it began with the order of rooms in a house that were being renovated, kind of a walkthrough of a house as you were fixing rooms. The next game was about labor and management and arbitrators in a labor dispute. Third game, uh, if my numbering's correct here, was about six patients being assigned to three different technicians, like medical techs, I think. And then finally, interestingly, the toughest game was about a robot exhibit or exhibition on Tuesday and Wednesday, kind of ordering that out. I'd love to see that game. It sounds kind of interesting. Um, and some of the feedback from that game certainly made it uh, intriguing. On, on the whole, though, my impression of this section, and we'll get to the matrix and the scaling itself in a minute, nothing outlandish here. We talked about it back in July of 2019, again, October two years ago. Uh, this has been a, a pretty steady middle of the road section, I think, for most people. No rule reports to the contrary this time either. Let's do reading comp, unless you have comp. Do it. All right. 27 questions in reading comp. And it starts with what I think would have been my favorite passage here. It's about that big glass pyramid in front of the Louvre designed by I am pay. Is it pie or pay? I think it's I am pay. I said pay at first time, so let's go with that. Um, the second passage was the comparative, and it was tricky. It was about historical exploration and the scientific method, how that applied to different kind of research analyses. Third passage, disclosure statements, conflict of interest. I'm sure that would have been my least favorite. And then a science passage to wrap it up on biomedical research, specifically dealing with nutrition and its relationship to diseases. I think cancer is the one that they talk most specifically about there. Tricky passage to wrap it up to. Um, this is, there's just no easy way to say it. This is a very hard section of reading comp. That has been the universal feedback since July, five years ago. This is tough. So if this felt difficult to you, you're definitely not alone. If it felt easy to you, congratulations, you dodged for what most people was a bullet. Yeah, it's like, especially the second, third, and fourth passages in there, none of them are easy. The comparative is that second one. When you title something and you say, well, what was it about? And it's historical exploration and research and the scientific method. Right away, that doesn't sound fun to me, John. Now, the Louvre passage, I would love to read. As as you said, that would actually interest me. I think that that was, uh, you know, a brilliant piece of architecture on his part. Uh, so, it sounds to me like the section starts interesting and then the rest of it, boy, doesn't sound that fun to me, uh, especially the second and fourth passages. So, not an easy section whatsoever. All right. So, we saw those two 
the games and reading comprehension, and then John, the LR that most everybody that we heard from saw. What was that? Yeah, in fact, universally, everyone I heard from had this set of LR, which is kind of interesting because back in July of 2019, they were still running two logical reasoning section tests. So originally on this exam, there were two different sections of LR. They could have chosen from either. It's possible they used both here, and we only heard about one. Here's the one I heard about. I believe it was 26 questions, but focus instead on the question topics. It was questions about bleaching coral reefs due to uh, acidity in ocean water, sperm whales navigating by echolocation, uh, a really, I think, confusing question for a lot of people about bird feathers and bird wings, and deposits that they had on them as they dug them up versus soil bacteria and trying to figure out where these deposits came from. Um, a boring question about moral excellence and it relates to artistic abilities. One about keeping a spare tire pumped up, kind of just in case as the instruction manual suggests. And then uh, another question that was pretty convoluted about macroeconomics, intro statistics, university prerequisites, essentially who was allowed to take what classes. Um, I think heavily conditional, that question. As will be a yeah. theme as we keep going. Indeed, it will be. Although I do have to laugh about the moral excellence and artistic abilities, because that sounds like one of those really broad, almost semi-philosophical type yeah. of questions that I think most everybody dislikes and are often not easy because they have like these real big themes that are floating around about what's good, what's bad, what's viable here, what morality is. I don't like it. Yeah, I don't either. Very right. unconcrete. Um so that's what you had there. So a mixed section. On the whole, though, most reports were, as we will see in just a second, that it was fair. It was reasonable. Some tough questions, nothing too outlandish, uh, and no long stretch of questions that just brutalize you one after another. All right. So let's get to the matrix for the international test then. Let me just remind everybody of how we do this matrix. We do it on the number of questions you can miss to get a 170. We start at a baseline where we say you can miss seven questions to get a 170. And then we take a look at each section and we either add, take away, or keep it exactly the same. So starting at minus seven, you can miss seven questions to get a 170. Let's look at that logic game section with the robots as the fourth tough game. That section is not going to move the scale, it's going to keep it at seven. Then we go to that very difficult reading comprehension section with the Louvre and analyzing history, disclosure statements, etc. That is going to loosen your scale. I'd say a solid one there. So now you're at minus eight to get a 170. And then last, that LR with the echolocation and the bird feathers and so forth. As John said, that's in more in the middle of the road of difficulty. That's not going to move the scale. And so that means that all testers with these three sections that are scored end up with eight questions that you could miss to get a 170 minus eight. We think it's unlikely that this goes to nine missed questions. So we're pretty comfortable with eight there. Yeah, I don't see the games moving it. And again, logical reasoning is always the trickiest to pin down, but I don't think it would move it either. The only wiggle here would be if that reading comp could somehow move it by two. And I don't think that would be the case either. So I'm comfortable with minus eight. And I think that's a good point. If it was going to have an impact, it wouldn't have it at the 170s. It would be downscale yeah. where it had a more outsized impact. And, and we've seen that with reading comprehension before, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. But our focus is on the 170 level. And that's it for the international test takers at the moment. That moves us along to the domestic test takers, primarily right. U.S. and Canada, both in person and remote getting just scads of different sections and different tests. John, I'll let you uh, open it up again. All right. Well, let's open it up in the same way then. Let's talk about the crystal ball as we start here. Um, the first thing that we should note, two things really that we should note is when Dave and I make these crystal ball predictions, what we're really predicting is test reuse. There's no way that we can anticipate content that's never been seen before. So anything that we talk about coming up that is truly new, it's the first appearance, that's really kind of off of our entire like landscape. We're not looking at that. That's not part of the discussion. What we want to talk about are test reuses. And interestingly here, everything that they reused for the major administrations domestically is something that we predicted in the crystal ball. In other words, I didn't see any reuse that appeared here for the main types of tests that wasn't one on that list that we talked about, even down to, as we'll see in a second, some of the topics that we suggested people study for reading comp. Those were covered. Um, the flood of grateful messages I got was 
frankly wonderful. And thank you guys for appreciating it. Uh, and it's nice to know that once again, somehow our predictions landed. Um, we had, I think we're batting a thousand here, frankly, as we will see. What I do want to talk about though, right up front is accommodated testing. What LSAC will often do if you are taking kind of like a one-off event, let's say you've got a two-day test where it's spread over two days, where you're taking a paper test in person or something that makes you somewhat unique in terms of the, the nature of how your test is administered. What can happen in those instances is you and anyone else kind of like you, which is typically a pretty small number, can get almost a one-off test. So you don't get the main test that you see just about everybody else talking about online. You can get something else. And I saw two of those tests actually happen here. And Dave, if it's okay with you, I want to start with those two. Most yeah. of the people- and I Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, you think about like a paper test. Well, they have to print that out. So you figure, do they just print them one at a time? No. They print, uh, you know, maybe a thousand. So then they keep reusing that. But the number of people who have paper test accommodations isn't a huge number relative to the overall size. So what you end up with is a relatively smaller group uh, ends up having some of these. And I think that's what you, we've identified. And it's possible that uh, some of the test takers in here weren't accommodated test takers. I mean, these are regular LSATs. They're just like any other LSAT. They can use them how they want. We just happen to see it more so in connection with accommodated test takers. So we're going to just kind of carve that out. And because um, we know that probably these weren't featured as prominently in terms of the overall pr mix, the percentages of tests. So John, those two tests... Yeah. Knock them out. In fact, I'm certain that's the case. Most everyone listening to this um, will not have seen any of what I'm about to cover. But the first test that we saw for some accommodated people, and maybe for some others, was a test that was originally given in January of 2019. So this was the five-year anniversary of this. We saw it in its most major reuse already back in November of 2021. And this is a test they clearly like because this is at least the fifth reuse of it. It was June 23 international. It was November 23 as a makeup. So they like this test. Here's what's on it. I'll start with logic games. The four game topics here. The first game was about computer installations. Then there's a really interesting game about colored statues and pillars and the order in which they go. Uh, a tricky game about branches, two branches of a bank corporation, east and west. And then the hardest game by far in this section, about nine apartments on three floors of a building. And the apartments were of different types. So the floors maybe were of different types, luxury, modern, and traditional. If that sounds familiar to you, this is the test you got. That section counted. Uh, let's keep going. The reading comp topics on this. It started with one about a whole bunch of different, almost global set of like plays and playwrights. You had some from Scotland. I think there was one from South America. Um, Athel Fugard was one of the authors in that. The next one, one I'd like to read, was about Pueblo Indian rock inscriptions and how they might have related to a supernova in the Crab Nebula, I believe. Mm -hmm. There was a passage about copyright and trademark law. That was the legal passage. And then it ended, I believe, with a passage about placebo drug research and may have even covered IBS, if memory serves. I'm trying to think back to the November 21 test a few years ago. I think that's right. Those were the four passages in the reading comp section. And the only LR that I heard about for this test in use this time contained these questions. Uh, I was one about car headlights being a distraction. Diamonds are precious, something like diamond mining or 3,000 3, years ago. That was a question about Marie Antoinette. I think it was the let them eat cake thing. Tech threats versus natural threats like tornadoes. And a question that got talked about a fair amount among the people who saw this about free radicals, which was sciencey and tricky. Very nice. So that was the scored content for at least one set of test takers that we saw. John, the nice thing is if somebody's listening to that and they're like, I want to hear more, we talked about this in episode 97 of the podcast when we covered November 2021. So if you want to kind of like get a little bit further into it, um, that would be the place to go. And ultimately, the scale for that test is minus nine. So we're not going to go through it individually just because there weren't as many test takers in that particular cohort, but that would be nine questions missed for 170. So a pretty nice scale, but of course that means some of the things that you saw were challenging at times. Yeah, I think the games had a bigger impact on that test um, than it did on some of these others, we'll see. The other test that was used for some accommodated people is a real favorite of theirs, and it dates a long way back, almost got eight years at this point. It's from February 2016. They've reused this a bunch. I won't go through the full list. The main reusage, though, was in October of 2020 uh, as an LSAT flex. 
back in the days when it was only three sections. But of course, February 2016 had two sections of LR originally, and I was not able to pin down which of the two was in use here. So you're going to hear me in just a second kind of hedge a bit. But let's start with games and reading comp where I do know exactly what was on it. The logic games on this test, again, February 2016, October 2020, were these. It was a game about a furniture sale, a game about artists, um, a tricky game about attendees to a conference in London, Madrid, or Paris. And then what seems like at a glance, it would have been a fairly straightforward game, but was a little tricky. It was about books on a bookshelf. And that was the fourth game in that particular section. So if those sound familiar, this is the test that you got. Our seal on this one was tricky too. Uh, it began with a passage about a sculptor, Edmonia Lewis, and the work that she did, a passage about workplace ethics, um, an interesting passage about the nature of suburban sprawl, and I think city planning. Uh, and then a passage at the very end, which I'd like to read just because the topic sounds so bizarre, about shrubs and hedges. Um, and I think someone who'd written a book about them. So there you go. Yeah, it's the uh, that English. The, the Pringle Prince thing? Is that what I'm thinking of? It, it's, it's the English uh, hedges. Okay. And like the aging of them and so forth, if I recall correctly. Your recall here may be better than mine. So well done. Um, but those were scored reading comp passages on that particular test. And then finally, as I said, there are two logical reasoning sections from this test that could have been used. I was unable to determine which one was. So I'm just going to give you some topics from both. If you hear a topic here, and this was your LR section, it was scored. So one section contained a question about moths and bats. It had a question about burglars. Um, there's a classic, or has been talked about a lot, question about absent. And then a question that gave a lot of people trouble about volleyball in that section. The other section of logical reasoning had questions about toll systems, question on altruistic behavior, um, and then a question dealing with psychologists and physics and the relationship between the disciplines, which again, I think was tricky. Yeah, and they could easily have used both of those, and just one of them would have been the scored uh, in terms of that, but that's because February 2016, one of the back when there were four LSATs a year, and that was one of the non-disclosed ones, February was never disclosed uh, in each year until much later. That's where this comes from. So we did talk about this kind of like set of problems and sections back on episode 68. So if this is your test, go back and listen to a little bit of that, uh, that we were talking about the October 2020 LSAT, uh, at least in the review, because back in February 2016, we didn't have this podcast. So we didn't do test recaps all that way back. So when this came around in October 2020, we actually did that episode 68 for you if you want more information. The interesting thing is, regardless of which LR section that you had, it does not matter. The scaling on this is minus eight. You could miss eight questions to get a 170 there. So that hopefully takes care of uh, oh, certainly a portion, definitely not all accommodated test takers, but we saw those two tests used in much less frequency than what we're calling the main administration content, which is what we're going to move to now, which is what the majority of people who would be listening to this probably experienced. Let's get to it. John, now the main you've been doing a great job. Main you feel up to- Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't right. trade that disclaimer thing you had to do for the world, so. I, I get to do the, the matrix yeah. and the disclaimer, and now you're doing all the content. It's a fair yeah. trade to No, I'd rather they ship me off to Australia. So, this is, this is perfectly fine for my penance. Um, let's start with logic games, which is where we typically begin. These days, and this has been the case now for almost a year, I think, we did not see any experimental games. So, all of the game sections and topics you're about to hear me talk about, they were all scored, they were all real. You should have had, if you were taking one of the main administrations and haven't heard anything that rings a bell yet, you should have had one of the three sections that I'm about to cover. And it started with a set of new games. This is where that wine labels game came from. 23 questions. We saw these straight away Wednesday morning when testing began. It started with a game about movies being spray spaced out or administered over six weeks. The next game was the wine labels. Specifically, it was about birds in different colors on five bottles. There was a game about five I heard various things here, five groups being placed into three different parks. Um, I think the most consistent I heard was public gardens. So maybe that rings a bell. And then finally, the last game in that section was about four employees making advertising pitches. That was the trickiest game in the section, but a section on the whole that I think most people felt was fairly manageable. I didn't hear nearly as many complaints about this as I did some other things. Put it that way. I think manageable is the right word. And once again, we see that the harder games often towards the end. Yeah, there you go. 
Um, the next two sections, this is where I think Dave and I can self-congratulate a little bit because both of these come from tests that we predicted in the crystal ball and told people to go research. The second set of games that I'll talk about here, also real, of course, 23 questions. These are from October 2022. Here they are. The first game was about visiting different countries, four countries, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. The second was about seven scientists or authors publishing a paper, and there were different um, authorship types, professors, graduate and undergraduate students. Then there was a game, another seven variable game, with seven summer camp counselors doing activities. This was fishing, hiking, kayaking. Saw this one get talked about a lot. And then another kind of interesting one about textile arts and goods. I believe it was an artist sending off um, various crafts, mittens, napkins, quilts, rugs, scarves to different craft fairs or markets. And that was the game that wrapped the section up. So, so had, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, how did you feel about the difficulty on that overall, which I think is what you're about to say. I was going to answer the question before you asked it, but I appreciate you <laughs> participating. Um, Again, I, I feel like this was another one that most people felt was okay. Um, and that's discounting any particular, quote, advantage that they may have gotten from us predicting it was coming up. This was just a pretty run-of-the-mill set of games, aside from perhaps that textiles game at the end, which I know threw people a little bit. Most of the rest of this yeah. was by the book. And I do have a comment about this as it relates to the crystal ball, but how about doing the the third of the scored sections? The these were the only logic game sections that we saw, but how about doing that? And then I'll kind of throw in the crystal ball comment. Yeah. In fact, I'll stay right in that crystal ball wheelhouse because this final section of games was also from a set that we predicted were likely to appear. This is from February of 2022, 23 questions. Here were the four games. Uh, it started with a game about two people being interviewed, I believe, at AM and PM. I've heard suspects, I heard various things, but interviews in the morning and afternoon. Then there was a game about dances, seven dancers doing four different dance types. Some had partners. I think the tap dancers were solo. There was a game about worker or volunteer shifts in singles and doubles. And then finally, another tricky game to wrap it up, six wings being renovated in north, south, and west um, were the wings, I think, of a building. I heard different things about that too. But the renovations north, west, and south should ring a bell. Yeah. Now that you mentioned, you know, these were two sections that we had, these were two tests that we had identified as high likelihood to be reused. So w when we started hearing on Wednesday morning that they were in reuse, obviously our first response was awesome. Um, it's easy with reading comprehension when you get it right, because you can say, hey, go research this topic and someone can research it before. It's harder to do it with games because I can't just say, go do a grouping game or advanced linear game. So one thing that's kind of interesting for those of you who kind of like go to the crystal balls or use the problem sets is the way we address this is I go in and select games that have similarities to the games on these particular tests. And so that's where we feel like, hey, you can't really necessarily go research something specifically, but we make recommended problem sets that are drawn with elements that have similarities to these games. We know some of the structural elements. We know the linearity, the grouping aspects of it. You know, if, if we know that there's a game coming out that has pairings like duets or matches, we'll go find games that have those elements. Same thing with like the AM, PM, mm -hmm. or the North, South, West kind of thing, we can go out and find those elements. It's not as flashy because it's not so obvious as, wait a second, you know, there's something about uh, Ansel Adams and, and uh, <laughs> photography. That's why I just saw that. It's right there. So it's not flashy like that, but it is equally useful when you go do those recommended problem sets because it is preparing you for the type of things that you'll actually see there. And John, as you kind of, uh, you know, had mentioned before, we didn't see any logic games administered on this. We don't expect any logic games to be administered as far as experimentals. Right. Obviously, there's real LG, but we haven't seen experimental logic games here for a while because we know the test is going to lose logic games starting in August. They've done other things to kind of maybe account for that in, in LR, but this was not an unexpected thing where all the experimentals that we saw were either reading comp or logical reasoning. I like that. Two subtle spoilers in there for anyone paying close attention. Ansel Adams and the inclusion of some game stuff in logical reasoning. We're going to get to both of those in that order. In fact, let's go to reading comp. And this to me is the most fun thing actually to review when we get it right, because we don't just get it right by tests. We don't just get it right by like theme or, or tonality. We get it right down to the actual topics. And that's what we were able to do here, as I'll explain. 
However, the first thing we saw on Wednesday morning when tests kicked off, alongside that set of new logic games that I started with above, was a set of new reading comp passages, 27 questions with topics we haven't seen before. These were the topics. There was a passage about Paul Marshall, who was an African-American, I believe Barbadian novelist, a passage that followed that about commercial fishing and the effects on fish populations, um, should they only catch fish that were of a certain size and what that meant to the populations. A passage, again, that would just bore me to tears about history and morality and laws. This was the comparative, and it looked at it from two different time periods, 1897 and 1945, I think. Uh, and then finally, a passage about open science collaboration, psychological studies, and trying to replicate results with uh, collaborative efforts going forward. You know, John, I'm noticing a theme. Every time something says something about morals or morality, you're saying, this is boring and I don't want to read it. It's boring because mine are so well established that there's just... I want to be able to improve on something, Dave. That's a spectacular save. Full Thank credit to you. I could learn about Didn't commercial Didn't expect fishing. that. Nope. <laughs> I've known you for a long time, so I'm, I'm skeptical of your claims. But I will say the commercial fishing one, you heard a lot of people complaining about that. Uh, even down to like one word kind of posts that were clear frustration fish, uh, that kind of thing. So definitely not an easy section. But as you said, a new section, we can't predict when something new is going to be used because there's really not any type of record on it. But that wasn't the full slate of passages that were out there. What else did they have? No, although interestingly, it was half of the slate of scored passages. We only saw two scored sections of logical reasoning this whole time. That was one that was new. The other that we saw was from the test that we predicted was the most likely to appear. 27 questions from August of 2021. So as soon as I saw the very first uh, passage topic here, I knew that we had nailed it. And I was just desperately hoping that people had paid attention to the crystal ball because we listed all four of these. I'll go through them. The first was about picking a national language for Nigeria. Uh, a passage you referenced before was number two about Ansel Adams and pictorialism, straight photography. I have no idea what this is, but F64 apertures. I know that has to do with like lens width. Camera setting. Yeah. Um, a passage about legal sentencing reduction, remedies as it was called for prosecutorial misconduct, a tricky one. And then I think probably the hardest for most people in the whole set, the comparative passage to wrap it up was about Lawrence Krauss and a book that he wrote called A Universe from Nothing about quantum fields. And again, the two passages took different perspectives on um, his views. That was I mean, Krauss universally reported as difficult. Nobody seemed to, to find that one easy. No, no, no. This is a, a a rough section. That Krauss passage will probably live as one of my favorites. I can't wait to read it because, John, I remember once we were talking about uh, crystal ball predictions and we had said, you know, this was a while back that they uh, that we thought that Lawrence Krauss might be one of the topics they use. And this person came back and said that El Sack would never do that. Krauss has been like discredited in some way. He's had some problems. And of course, we were able to go back and say, yes, they would. They just did it within the past year. Uh, and this is the benefit of having like a historical record of what they do in a in an isolated period, whether it's three months or six months, you can't figure out what LSAC is going to do. It's only when you start looking at the kind of wave of history with them, when you can look at eight years, 10 years or more and start to connect the dots that you can see certain patterns in terms of what is happening. That's why we're able to do this crystal ball kind of thing. And fortunately, we've been right now uh, quite a number of times. Doesn't mean that every single person is going to look at those topics and then get them on their test. No, because there's obviously two sections here. The people who got this section, uh, they at least got some kind of topic for warning. But if you got the other section, again, that's a new section. We can't predict that. You're not going to get it. So some, I saw some people online talking about that and they, they, it was gratifying because they really recognized they're like, didn't work for me, but I see other people it worked for them, which is awesome. And that's, uh, that's kind of cool. In, in a sense though, John, this is not an easy section. So how much of a reward it is, I am not sure, but I can tell you that people would say to me, I'm glad at least I knew who some of these people were and had some familiarity with it. The confidence boost yeah. was huge. And that's really what we do this for. Yeah. I wouldn't wish this section on anyone, frankly, but if you are going to get it, at least you could have gone into it theoretically, having paid attention to us with some sense of what was coming and, and maybe a little context for what the, the passages were about. By the way, Dave, if that last one about Lawrence Krauss does interest you, go read the book. A universe from nothing. It's fantastic. It's pretty approachable physics, some quantum mechanics and cosmology, but it's doable. It's really excellent. 
That's a non sequitur, pretty approachable physics to me. I'm no interest in it. <laughs> Fair enough. And the the thing you mentioned about his discrediting, uh, he got like low-key me too and somebody thought that that was just disqualifying for the LSAT to ever use him, and I had to explain that happened before August 21 when he first appeared on this test. So already their theory was debunked. Yes, and I don't know the circumstances of it, but either way, they'd used him, and you can't always predict what LSAC is going to do. Now, those were the two scored sections, John. Yes. I know some people had experimental reading comp. What did we see there? Yeah. And this was, again, the only experimental section that we saw as well. So three sections total, two real, and now this one of experimental. Uh, we saw this primarily paired with the Nigerian language Lawrence Krauss section. 27 questions on these topics. There was an African-American poet, um, last name of Harper, I believe, and modes of literature and different forms and times, essentially how things had changed. Uh, the book Cybernetics, an engineer and predictions that this person got right and wrong. Uh, a comparative passage, this is easily the one I think I like to read most as well, on e-cigarettes and vaping, and then on Japanese nuclear power and the policymakers' bad decisions. In other words, bad choices you make when you're either unfamiliar with something, like vaping, or your familiarity makes you scared of it. I think they use the uh, examples in Japan of Hiroshima and Fukushima. So, to transition instead of away from nuclear energy to something else. And then the final passage on judicial conciliation uh, and differences of opinion. So that's all I have to say about that. Excellent. One. And we saw that a lot, I thought, with the uh, the passage with Krauss and Ansel Adams and the Nigerian language. Yeah, that seemed to be a very common pairing. Not saying that it was exclusively that way, but that section would have been your experimental there. And that book, Cybernetics, not to be confused with Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard, a completely, completely different book. I've read one of them, but <laughs> I hope it's cybernetic. It wasn't. Man. It wasn't. <laughs> I'm a sci-fi fan. What can I say? <laughs> but there you go. I love it. Now, I'm going to make a comment here, Dave, and you may disagree with me. I, I hope this holds true for the future, but it did strike me as a little strange. For a four-day test with 20,000 plus people to only use two scored sections of reading comp for nearly everybody, I, I was a little surprised by the limits of that. Surprised in a good way. I don't think they need to do more than that, but typically, historically, they have. I'll tell you what it says to me, at least my concern, is that I wonder if there's not a third scored section out there somewhere. That's where I was going with it. Yeah. Um, and if that's the case, uh, we didn't hear about it. And again, there's very little we can do if we're not getting reports. There's only so many people that we can talk to, but we talk to everybody who you know reaches out, uh, you know, especially on Saturday night after the test was over, we got a flood of reports from people. But if we don't hear from some of the people who maybe had a third section, maybe it was only administered to 500 people, uh, third scored section, there's no way we can report on it. Do I wonder whether it's out there? Yeah, sure I do. But right now, I don't have any evidence to substantiate that beyond speculation. Well, there you go. Um, so yeah, hopefully we didn't miss anything. If we did, let us know. Um, it'd be good to know, regardless of whether it gets applied here. And then we get to logical reasoning, and once again, a little surprised by um, the scarcity of real content. We only saw two real sections. I'll go through them both. The first one that we saw was again from the test that we predicted was most likely, August 2021. This is the same test where that Ansel Adams passage set came from. 25 questions, I believe, but don't go off question count. Go off topics. And here were the most commonly talked about questions in this section. Remember, this is logical reasoning. These are real. There was a question early in the section about posted speed limits and inclement weather, one about roasted chickens and that they cost more to produce than fresh chickens, a really tough question, many people said the hardest thing on their entire test, about monkeys using tokens in exchange for fruit. So if you had this section, I'm almost certain you'll remember that one. There was a question about military and then investigating gravitational waves to be used as weapons, uh, a woman, Anna, deciding between apartments and ruling one out so she had to choose the other. A pair of side-by-side -side fossilized dinosaur footprints and the relationship of those dinosaurs to one another. Interestingly, you said this before, Dave, they like to repeat topics. There were a few dino questions in various sections that we saw in LR this time too. Mm -hmm. A couple more. Um, a tough question about life or specifically no life and no point in searching for life in globular star clusters and galaxies. And then another question that got some... Um, caused a ruckus, billboards obstructing people's view and whether that uh, essentially equated to property damage. 
So there Could you go. Be, if it's right in front of your house. <laughs> I would imagine I'd have a complaint. So <laughs> those questions, and again, that's obviously not all of them. That's only about eight of the 25 or 26. But those were all real. Those should have all been in the same section. If you recognize even one or two of them, that section counted for you. And logical reasoning was by far the most doubled up section type here. So hopefully that clarifies things for a lot of people because I know there was confusion. This is where taking notes would make a difference because especially in LR, knowing that, hey, that monkey's question was your section one or section two or whatever it was in your placement, then you could say, I know that's the one. And you'd have a feeling about how you felt about the exam, your performance, keeping your score, canceling, all those kinds of good things. Absolutely. There was one other scored section of logical reasoning. Again, I believe it was 25 questions, uh, but don't go off that. These were new from what we could tell. So this wasn't a test we predicted because we'd never seen it before. But here were some of the most commonly talked about topics there. I'll give eight or nine of these as well. One early on about GMOs and organic produce labeling. The question that people talked about the most was about orange cars, their reliability and that conscientious drivers tend to choose them. Question about owning a home computer and having children's games on it. Uh, tough question about raindrop particles and rainwater, specifically salt spray and industrial pollutants. Question about putting acetone, scientists put acetone on these carnivorous pitcher plants to cover their fluorescence and then measuring the number of bugs that they were able to attract and consume, like fly-eating plants or something. A politician's belief about internet speed and whether it should be capped or not, and then supporting a law that ran counter to his or her own beliefs. Um, a tricky question about babies born in a hospital and delivery patterns over the course of a day between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., Street noise and bird populations, how birds communicate. I think about predation uh, in the context of street noise. And then another tough question, and here's more dinosaurs. In this case, about uh, dinosaur vertebrae and their tail feathers and this relationship to modern day birds, whether dinosaurs could fly or not. So there you go. All yes. of that is real. All of that is real. The GMO question, genetically modified stuff, is really was the question that I think almost everybody recognize. That was one of the ones I saw most commonly cited. So if you could figure out where that one was in your order, if you had multiple LRs, then you'll know that that one was real. And John, the interesting thing here is you, you talked about this, only two LRs that we saw that were scored, that that was paired with when you had an experimental LR, three or four different sections. At least. And of yeah. course, when they do that, they don't have to use a lot of sections because it gets very obscured. Uh, quite quickly as to what experimental is going on with, uh, you know, which scored section, what's real and what's not. It's very hard for students to feel that. And I think they've started to understand that when they test, you know, say four experimental LRs, what they're really saying is we're going to put out so much uh, noise that you're not going to be able to figure out where the real signal is inside of that. Yeah. However, those LR sections had some the experimental ones had some interesting features that we noticed. Yeah, this was the second mini spoiler that I alluded to from you before, which is what we're starting to see, and this is not the first instance of it, I promise it won't be the last, we're starting to see them doing a lot of experimental LR sections, and within those, incorporating some new, I don't want to call it question types, but question forms or constructions that are strikingly similar to the things that get tested in logic games. A lot of conditional rules, a lot of connected variables, a lot of like chain inferences, and much more comprehensive or much more complex uh, organizations than what we typically would see in a normal LR section to date. And there's no surprise that they're doing this. It's pretty clear why. As games get phased out starting in August, they still don't want to lose that entire skill set. The analytical reasoning that's being tested there is a valuable skill. They're trying to keep it and they're going to do so by incorporating more of it into logical reasoning. That's going to happen. Yeah, you're seeing some questions that are almost more mathematical mm -hmm. in nature. Math sets, uh, I'm not going to say probabilities so much, but like when you have these connections, I think about it also, I'm also seeing a little bit more formal logic. Yeah. You're seeing that with a lot of the conditionality stuff uh, that's going in there. These are more abstract analytical features. They're more black and white to some extent. doesn't mean that that makes them easier, but the logic games is more black and white. So it becomes something where these look like logic games features. The thing I'll say that's interesting to you and I is, look, they're testing this stuff right now. And when they're testing it this frequently, this often, what they're really kind of signaling is when we hit August, they're going to start using these questions, which means 
you may think to yourself, if you're a Logic Games lover, you should be taking the LSAT between now and June. All right, that that much we know. But if you're a, a Logic Games hater, what they're really saying to you is, is don't think that starting in August 2024, you're getting off scot-free. We're going to throw some of these ideas in there. We're going to start mixing them in more frequently. So think about that when you're looking at which LSAT to take. Because if Logic Games is like, well, I don't love it, but I don't hate it, maybe it's a better thing to take the LSAT now with the known scenario versus the unknown of what they're going to do with LR in August. Yeah. Starting in August. Right. And to, to make this slightly more concrete for anybody who encountered it and is wondering exactly what we're talking about, let me give two questions that I think are emblematic of this or exemplify it. One had to do with colored balls, several different colored balls. I think one had a circle on it, one had a triangle on it, different combinations. And they were asking you questions, essentially math questions about ways in which these balls could be combined or selected. That was experimental. If you had it and it freaked you out, don't worry, it did not count. But like I say, it's the future. It won't be a whole section, but there are going to be more and more instances of questions like that. The other one that I know gave people fits in a similar way was about four doctors being assigned to different hospital shifts, I think over five days. And it was something of a strange justify the conclusion question. If which doctor was assigned to what day, would it force this other doctor onto a different day? That's a games question, frankly. Very much so. So neither of those counted in logical reasoning this time, but that's all coming um, I don't know that they'll wait till August, frankly, to put it into a scored section, not to freak anybody out, but there's nothing that but says they can't did. start testing. Well, sorry. <laughs> well, I didn't say that. Not, not only to, freak, not exclusively <laughs> to freak somebody out. You can be a little freaked out, but you can also prepare. So know that this sort of thing is, is the future of logical reasoning, at least to some extent. All right. All that aside, all that content there. Obviously, we've covered the international tests. We've covered a couple of tests that we saw that were in less use. Now we've covered what really we saw as the majority usage tests here. Let's go through the matrix for those majority usage tests. And let's cover this one more time right from the top. What we're trying to do is to predict the number of questions you can miss to get a 170. All right. So that's an easy kind of like high difficulty line. It's uh, easier for us to see the difficulty levels at that scale uh, than it is, say, at 160 or 150. And to look at that, we say that the baseline is that you can miss seven questions to get a 170. So that's what that minus seven, minus eight, minus nine actually means when we talk about this. Now, when we get into individual sections, starting at minus seven, we rate the difficulty of each section, and then that will either move the scale up or down by one or keep it as is with a zero. So what you do is you listen through this and you say, all right, which section did I have? And then according to whatever the rating is, you adjust from minus seven. So in logic games is where we're going to start. We're going to go through each of the three sections here. The one thing that I will remind everybody is we're always conservative in our predictions. We'd rather be conservative and have the actual scale be looser than to have it the other way around. That generally produces a happier result based on expectations as opposed to the reverse. Let's go through that first section. This is the one with the movies, the one with the wine labels that inspired John and I's choices for drinks tonight, the one with the parks and the advertising pitches. Uh, 23 questions, if I recall correctly. This is in the middle of the road. I don't think this is going to have any effect that's going to keep you at minus seven. Same thing is going to be true for the next section, which was the country visits, the scientific paper authors, the camp activities, and then the textiles like mittens and so forth. That is also going to be at the 170 level, uh, no impact. Also zero, keeping you at minus seven. I think, John, you and I are under the belief that as you go lower in the test in terms of the scaling, 165, 160, then it starts to loosen a little bit more, but not at the 170 level. And then last, uh, from Feb 22, this was the game sets that were the interviews, the dance type, the worker shifts, and the north, west, uh, south uh, wing renovations. That also has no impact on the scaling, keeps you at minus seven overall. So no matter which game section you had, you're still at minus seven. That takes us to reading comprehension. Any interjection? Oh, I can just feel the fury. Um 
that we just said all three scored sections of games aren't going to loosen thing at the 170 level. But the fact is, when things in games do loosen it at that level, they have to be particularly nasty. And I didn't see anything that I think would qualify this time as that. You don't even want that, honestly. You don't want the computer virus game on your test, you know, for most people. Right, right, right. All right, everybody's sitting at minus seven, at least in the majority here. Uh, let's go to reading comprehension. Let's start with that new section about the uh, novelist, the bar- basically Barbados. I think Haiti might have been in there as well. The terrible commercial fishing passage, the morality and law that you don't want to read, and then the psychological experiments. This was a hard section. This is going to move the scale from seven to eight. Now you could miss eight questions if you had this section. Uh, and who knows? It could have even more of an effect as you go lower onto the scoring scale and get into like the lower 160s and the 150s. It was not an easy section from all reports. And then the other one that we had predicted all four of the topics and named them in the crystal ball itself. This was from August, 2021, the uh, Nigerian language, the Ansel Adams photographs and the F64 apertures, the legal sentencing, and then Lawrence Krauss and quantum fields. This passage, uh, we've talked about it on a few occasions before. We always have this as literally being not just moving it by one, but maybe even two at times. Yeah. Um, when we've debated this, this is a rough section uh, from what we know about it. Super hard is the way I think I would describe it scientifically. <laughs> it's very eloquent. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know that I could fully commit to two, but if it turned out to be two, knowing that we're a little conservative in the first place, it wouldn't surprise me. This is a pretty rare event. Uh, I can't think of too many times where you and I flirted with the idea that one section could move the score, the scaling by two. This is one of those times where I, I could see it possibly happening. So what we can say confidently is, at least from our estimation, everybody right now would be eight questions missed to get a 170. Uh, these reading comps, though, probably are having a further loosening effect as you go down the scale. Uh, so you're getting a benefit there. If you're not scoring at the 170s, and obviously that's that includes a lot of people, if you're at 160, you're like, hey, maybe I got a little bit more to play with there, another additional missed question than I would have otherwise expected. And that brings us to logical reasoning. Uh, let's start off with the section from August 2021. This was the monkey tokens, the billboards, the dino footprints, the roasted chickens, and the speed limits. This is, I'd say, in the middle of the road, that is going to keep the scale as it was. So for everybody, that'd be minus eight still. And then the other scored section that we saw about the GMO labeling, the orange cars, the carnivorous plants, um, and the dinosaur vertebrae and feathers, that I think is on the easier side as far as LR is concerned, but we're going to keep that in the middle and make that a zero as well. And so almost everybody here ends up with a minus eight, and then there's some variation depending upon which reading comprehension uh, section you had and how that would affect scores going down a little bit. But that is the full matrix there for the the test forms that were uh, primarily used for the majority of test takers in the U.S. and Canada. Yep, agreed. I know there's some bittersweetness too in this because people always want games to do more than they typically do, at least at the high level. And a lot of people who got that brutal set of reading comp had it paired with the experimental reading comp that was, frankly, pretty easy. Certainly a lot easier. That's cybernetics and the vaping in Japanese nuclear power. So to have those two sections of reading comps side by side is uh, that's a particular bummer when the one that you hated so much is the one that counts. And the one that most people I think found very doable doesn't matter. So again, I, I know that this can be a bit of a, a thorn. Well, here's a positive, if you want the rose to that, was that several of the LR experimentals weren't that easy. And so for a lot of people, they thought that experimental was real because it felt harder than the other section. So finding out that that didn't count can actually be kind of like the blessing on this, you know, kind of recomprehension curse that everybody was, was, was dealt. So mixed bag there in terms of what's good and what's bad. It really depends upon your strengths, how you've evaluated things. And hopefully you've done a really close analysis that says, you know, what's the maximum number of questions I might have missed? What's the minimum questions I might have missed? And you give yourself a good score range and figure out how you feel about it. If you're uncertain, use score preview and, uh, you know, get a good look at your score beforehand. 
Either way, everybody's going to find out on Wednesday, January 31st at 9 a.m. Eastern Time or thereabouts. Yeah. And as a reminder, too, for those of you who are kind of new to this, which in January is not all that many people, all you will get on that score release day, that Wednesday the 31st, bright and early, is your score and its percentile. You won't see what the scales are. So unless they release one of these forms, Dave and I won't know that we're right or wrong. You won't know how many questions you actually missed, how you did in each section. You certainly won't know the individual questions. All you see is a number out of 180 and a percentile out of obviously 100. So just prepare exactly. for that. If you're expecting more than you get, you'll be disappointed. Now, I'm going to address one more thing, which is obviously the crystal ball, the test, especially the number one test that we thought they would reuse is in fact, or was in fact reused. So there's not enough time to do a crystal ball for the February LSAT. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So if you are taking February, simply listen to what we said about specific test usages, strike those from the list, strike those topics from the list, and then move on to the next kind of like cut of predicted tests, as well as the remaining topics. Uh, if any adjustments need to be made to the logic games, I will make them. But right now, still a lot of the content that we had put in there uh, is applicable to February. So there's not going to be a February crystal ball. If you are taking April or June, there is a crystal ball that is on March 6th. You can go to powerscore.com forward slash free seminars and sign up for that. Obviously, that's a couple months away. We'll have both Ju January and February information under our belts. At that point, the predictions will change uh, probably significantly. Uh, and that'll be coming up here in about a month and a half. So, John, any final thoughts? No, I'm glad we're through it. Um, and I, I wish everyone who listened to this well. I hope you got some good news in this. And again, on the 31st, I hope you hit your number. We're rooting for you. Absolutely. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it. And if you've enjoyed it, leave us a comment and a rating. And if you had any test content that you can't recognize, send that in an email to lsatpodcast at powerscore.com. That will be forwarded to us post haste. We're always happy to see additional information coming on in, and we do appreciate it. On behalf of John and myself, we hope that you utterly destroyed the January LSAT. and literally are the happiest person in the world right now with the information that we've shared. If not, regroup, get ready for the next time, and just have confidence in yourself. In the meantime, it's cold out there. Stay safe. We'll talk to you soon.